Welcome to a lesson with Dr. Powell. Let's take a look at an idea called an inner product space. What is this? It's simply a vector space with um, a product on it of some kind. We're gonna call it a um, inner product and it can be found from a something called a positive definite symmetric bilinear form. And we've talked a little bit about what this is um, at least in terms of matrix multiplication, but pretty much this is what it is. It's some kind of pairing idea or form where we can put two things together. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that. Just a little uh, example, the dot product is an inner product. Um, when we take the dot product between two vectors and the different properties that it has. So we'll keep that in mind as we look at these. All right, so pretty much if we fix one of the entries and we let the other guy be like, you know, variable so you can input things into it, that idea actually is a linear transformation. Um, you can do it in this component or that component. Um, you also know that it's symmetric. You can do like a dot product. You can do u dot v or v dot u. It's going to be the exact same thing. Serving as a transformation would be like, well, if I have like u dot, and let's have two vectors added together, like v1 plus v2, um, that's going to be equal to u dot v1 plus u dot v2. What does that mean? That means u dot is like a linear transformation, and it passes across addition, right, to the respective parts, because that's what linear transformations do. Um, um, also, if you put a scalar, if you put a scalar here and uh, and a scalar here, they could pass outward, k1, k2. So that's if we fix u right here, or if we fixed v um, instead, it'd be the same thing going the other way. We also will, will require that it's positive definite. That means if you throw the same thing into itself, like you know v dot v, you're always going to get a positive uh, real number here. Um, that's uh, what it means um, in that case. And in fact, this is actually, given an inner product, you can actually define distances and lengths. And so you kind of need this idea because the way you define your distance or your length is the square root of this, all right? Square root of the, of the inner product is the uh, what we'll call the length of the vector with respect to this measurement or this inner product. So there's different ways of measuring things. The normal dot product is how we usually think of what we usually think when we think of length of a vector, because what is this? This is like the, the sum of the products, uh, the sum of the squares of the entries. So if V for instance is AB, then this right here is A squared plus B squared, the normal way we think of finding length. However, there are other ways of finding length. All we got to do is use a different positive definite symmetric bilinear form. Well, wait a minute. How is a dot product um, a symmetric definite bilinear form, right? It must have a matrix associated with it, and it does. Let's go to that point. It's this right here, 1, 1, 0, 0. You can put... And the way we can represent putting things into it, which we've seen in another um, video here, we have two different inputs, W here and V transpose here. We think of uh, the vectors as being columns, so we put transpose to make it a row. And so V transpose W is the same thing as a dot product, like we usually have. We're using the identity matrix. That's a pretty simple bilinear form, but it works. And it's and it's a positive definite. It's only eigenvalues, so they are just uh, just one, just has one eigenvalue, and it's positive. Um, another, here's another example though. This is a symmetric matrix, and it's positive definite. You can go through that and uh, calculation, look at the characteristic polynomial, and notice that it only has positive eigenvalues. It's positive definite, which means that um, if you put the same vector in on both sides, it'll always be positive. Um, that's one result that we have. If the eigenvalues are positive, then that makes this positive definite in that case. So we can serve as a nice inner product. So this matrix can serve as inner product. Um, let's use this notation to signify the pairing with associated with this um, inner product. So we take this right here 
and we, out, we use the matrix, put the one, two, and the two, negative one on that side. If we're going to take the uh, inner product of these two guys relative to this symmetric bilinear form and matrix multiplying out, we get three. Now, in contrast, if we took the dot product, we would have gotten something different. One, uh, one times two would be two, and two times negative one would be um, negative. So two would be negative two. So you'd end up getting zero as the dot product between these guys. Um, and notice that three is very different than zero. So interesting, because relative to the regular dot product, um, these two guys are orthogonal to each other. But to this one, they're not. Okay, so we carry the idea of orthogonality to inner products as well, respect to different, if uh, the output is zero, we say they're orthogonal with respect to that inner product. So orthogonality can differ from inner product to inner product. The usual way we think about it and visualize it as things being perpendicular to each other is based off of the, uh, the normal dot product for orthogonality. But different types of orthogonality exist for different inner products. Okay, so we've talked about this, and our product gives us a notion of distance. Length squared is equal to um, that. So, you know, and in particular, you can think, well, if you have like two vectors, you know, V and W, what's the distance between, between them or between maybe like the endpoints of the vectors, right? So like V minus W. Well, and so with respect to an inner product, you get something like this. Um, notice that we're using properties of it being a linear transformation of both components. It's bilinear, has two inputs. And so it's kind of like multiplication, really. We're just distributing. That's all we really get from it. Um, inner product, it's like multiplication, it's product. So we can distribute it like, you know, this guy to that guy, the two different parts, which since it's symmetric, you, the, uh, V, W, and, and W, V are the same, um, different. So we, so if we have like V, v W minus and minus W, V, these actually combine into one because they're the same, because it's a symmetric bilinear form. So it tells you it's this like multiplication, if you will, is commutative. Um, and then you'd get something like that. Okay, so that's our notion of distance. All right, so here's an example using this inner product right here. Um, uh, we can find the length of this guy, 1, 3. How do we do that? We just find out what the inner product is with itself, and we take a square root, square root of 26. But according to the regular um, dot product, using the matrix I here, um, we get square root of 10. Notice different lengths for different inner products. Okay, here's an example of an inner product um, for a vector space, which is continuous functions from this closed interval, 0 to 2 pi, into R. And we're going to use, um, so this is our vector space, um, and we're going to have an inner product on it. So this is the inner product, where we're just going to multiply the two functions together and integrate them and integrate the product from zero to two pi. This is actually a nice inner product. It's a symmetric bilinear form because you can interchange G and F, that's just fine. Um, an integral is very linear. You can, like it passes across addition, you know, you know, you have two things like, you know, F plus G, DX, you know, naturally it cross and also, um, Scalars can pop out of it as well. If you have a scalar here, k, you can put the k on it, and the k passes through. So, I mean, integrals are very, um, uh, are very uh, linear in that sense. In fact, it's bilinear in both in both g and f in this case, and um, and it's symmetric, and it's also positive definite. Why would that be? Um, well, think about it. Like f squared, right? Wait a minute. So, um, so assuming that f is not the um, the zero function, so we should clarify that. Okay, with itself. I mean, unless so, we going back here when we're thinking about 
um, positive definite VV. This is as long as V is not the zero vector in this case, right? If V is a zero vector, of course, that'll, that'll be true. So, um, all right. So what we're going to, um, and uh, what we're going to say here, at least in this case, F is not zero. And we might have to increase our equivalence class sizes to make this work um, uh, using, de depending on how we define what our, how to take our integral. Um, with a Riemann integral, or there's other ways of thinking about it, like Lebesgue or something like that. But we have to be careful here because um, because when if f is not zero, there are ways of uh, there are times when this could actually be um, this uh, integral could actually be zero depending on the type of integration we're using. But if if that's true, we just kind of increase our um, vectors by thinking of them as uh, collections of functions that um, have the same um, okay, um, collections of functions which differ by a function that measures out to be zero under this integral, something like that. But nonetheless, um, we get the idea. Um, that's a little technical, but nonetheless, we have this uh, inner product that works. It follows the, it follows the ideas that we need. Okay. So here's a little example. Um, suppose we take a subspace of our vector space, which is like, these are functions, like one, like f of x equal to one, f of x equal to cosine x, or f of x equal to sine x. We have different functions here. Those are like vectors, right, in our space. And these are actually orthogonal to each other. And here's this little example. What if we just test to see if sine and cosine are orthogonal to each other respect to this inner product? Well, we multiply them together and we integrate from zero to two pi. We can use a trig identity, this one, sine of two x is two sine x cosine x. So realize we're just integrating this. And sine two x goes through two whole periods. And that Well, that definitely has an integral of zero. So, and all the others should be fairly clear. Um, cosine x and one or sine x and one, you're just taking the integral of from zero to two pi. And those are, that's also zero. So these are orthogonal to each other. All right, now, what if we want to project a function like f of x equal to x orthogonally onto the subspace that's spanned by those vectors? All right, so this is orthogonal projection uh, with respect to this inner product. This is going to be the closest that, um, that x can possibly get with respect to this inner product to this subspace. All right, we're not looking at... Um, we're not looking at an orthogonal complement. We're actually looking at um, the projection right down to that. So we're not adding to the spaces, but we're just seeing what we get. Now, from the Gram-Schmidt process, what we do is we actually project, and then we subtract off that projection from where we're at. But we're not going to do that right now. We just want to look for that projection. So let's just project x onto that um, onto uh, um, these vectors, one, cosine x and sine x, which are orthogonal to each other and linearly independent. Um, this will uh, this this function that we end up getting will be a linear combination of these guys. And it'll be the fun the uh, linear combination that's closest to this function under the center product. Now we can talk about the uh, uh, talk about the process that we go through right here. But in general, maybe we want to use more functions than that, more than just one cosine x, sine x, maybe to go cosine 2x, sine 2x, and so forth. We, this is actually a very large orthogonal um, a collection. It's not orthonormal. We could adjust a few things, maybe on in the inner product or on these guys themselves, to make it orthonormal. But, um, but since they're orthogonal, we can still use this projection idea. Now, if we project it onto lot, you know, so we're looking at a subspace generated by lots of these. In fact, even um, uh, going out, you know, forever on these guys and have an infinite sum, um, and maybe adjust what our notion is of integration and so forth, um, we can actually describe uh, any function pretty much exactly by an infinite sum of these guys called a Fourier series. The more terms we use, the closer we actually get to um, or, or actually writing down what the function is as a sum of these guys. 
but we're just going to do a few of them or um, just th three functions from that set, these ones right here. So how do we do this? Gram-Schmidt, same kind of idea that we did before. We say X and we inner product with that guy, then we divide by inner product of that guy with itself. It's the same basic thing to get these coefficients here. That's what we're after. We get these coefficients and then we say X will be at best, it's like a least squares approximation. In fact, it's the same idea because we're just, it's a it's an orthogonal projection just like that is. Um, and we end up getting, uh, so we can compute these coefficients. This will be the best thing from the space. Now in doing so, um, uh, here's a little calculation here if I did this right. So uh, on this part right here, notice, um, uh, notice that we have, um, okay, so cosine, so this part right here, um, we're going to be plugging in 2 pi, which will make that guy 0, and 0 makes it 0. Um, over here, 2 pi and 0 are actually the same output for this part right here. This is a little tabular integration, so we're multiplying these things. We're doing integration by parts um, on this integral right here. So you end up getting zero as that coefficient. The other guys we can we can uh, work through. Um, and let's see, we end up getting, let's adjust this a little bit. Oh, okay, so this would be actually, so looking at this, those cancel and that, we actually get, um, don't know why I had written that down, but we get pi, if I had done this calculation, so pi minus sine x, so. Um, so here's minus sine x, and we have, um, okay, so pi. So this is actually up to pi right here. Okay, so I think that looks a little better. All right, so pi minus, um, minus sine x. And so this part right here doesn't quite come all the way down there. It looks more like this right here. Okay, so something like that, whatever. But however it graphs, you can take a look at it. But just notice that as long as we get these coefficients right, maybe as an exercise, you can go back through and see where I have an error. Um, anyways, we have pi minus sine x is approximately x. Okay, now, of course, um, on that interval and that approximation might not be very good. Um, that's because we didn't use very many of those functions, many of those vectors as we were as we're putting it down. But the more we use, the closer we can actually get to x, and that would be what we considered to be a Fourier series. Thanks for watching.